The, um, just so you know this, the reading <clears throat> that's paired with this gospel reading for today is part of the ending of the story of what happened between Joseph and his brothers after Joseph became the right hand man for the Pharaoh and the brothers came from Israel where there was a great famine to bake the Pharaoh for some grain and did not know, did not recognize their brother, who of course was undoubtedly very splendid looking as the uh, chief spokesman for the Pharaoh. And what happened in that was that Joseph did something that was totally against both the Hebrew and the Egyptian culture of the day. He forgave his brothers for what they had done to him and said to them, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. So you would have heard that lesson if we had gone that direction. This passage from Matthew is one that is often in the lectionary, but usually skipped by preachers for preaching. And you'll see why. Jesus has been doing a lot of things with the disciples, with the Pharisees, and we pick up here after he says very unhappily, quoting Isaiah, this is Jesus speaking, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. And now our lesson picks up. Listen for the word of God. Then he called the crowd to him, and he said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? Jesus answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one person guides another, both will fall into a pit. Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. And he said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But whatever comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and that is what defines. Out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sinai. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Jesus did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, she keeps shouting after us. He answered, 
I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Okay. Keep in mind what I said about the other passage for today. And lucky you, we go way back here get to Matthew. Now, it is extraordinarily hard in any culture, in any age, in any place and time to learn to go against the flow. When I went in the army, one of the first pieces of advice I was given was, go with the flow. That's good advice sometimes, and sometimes it's very bad advice. I had been told in the introductory course for new chaplains coming in the army that it would be at least 10 years before I would have a chapel service of my own. So I just said, okay, that's the way it works. You know, you have to be a major before they're gonna let you lead a chapel service. So, <laughs> I go from the basic course to my first assignment. I report in, as I was supposed to do, to the senior chaplain on post. It's a lovely ritual. You walk in, you stop three paces in front of the desk, you render a hand salute and say, Chaplain Jackson reports, sir. He's supposed to return the salute. This guy just sat in his chair, didn't look at me. So I stood there holding the salute. Then I repeated myself, sir, Chaplain Jackson reports, sir. Oh, sit down. <laughs> so I sat. He said, have you been told what you're going to be doing here? I said, no, sir. I was told that you would tell me that. Oh. All right. Here are your assignments. You are, as of now, the religious education chaplain for this post. As of now, you are the counseling chaplain for this post. As of now, you are the person who will oversee the enlisted who are supposed to be helping us. You will be the hospital chaplain and you will be the alcohol and drug chaplain. I didn't know what to say. I just stood there looking at him. And then he said, and you will have the 10 a.m. Protestant service. It was all I could do not to say to him, excuse me, sir, what do you do? <laughs> I didn't say that. But I was stunned that I was to have the Protestant service. Well, what we had been told in the chaplain officer basic course was it's a wide represent representation of denominational backgrounds in the army. Duh. Really? Yes. <laughs> and what we were told to do was when you have the opportunity to lead a chapel service, please use the format you would use if you were in a civilian church in your denomination because people 
come from a variety of expectations about what constitutes worship. So, when I did my first bulletins for the 10 a.m. Protestant service, they looked very much like what we do here, including there was an Old Testament lesson, a psalm for the day, the epistle lesson, the gospel lesson, we had a prayer of confession, and we often used either the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed as an affirmation of faith. We did that for three weeks. <laughs> and as I was about to start my sermon, this lady stood up. This was back when ladies wore the big hats to church. This lady stood up with a big hat, put her hands on her hips, and said, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> I said, excuse me? What is this crap? She said. She holds up the bulletin. Prayer of confession? We don't have anything to confess. It's those people out there that don't come to chapel. They should be on their knees confessing. Not us. We are the good people. And what's all this scripture? Don't you know anything about preaching? You take one verse or at the most two and you talk about them for 15 to 20 minutes. You get rid of this stuff that's in here. We just want to sing an opening hymn and a closing hymn and say the Lord's Prayer and that's it. I said, ma'am, I'll talk to you after the service in my office. I'm not sticking around, she said. And out she went. Well, the rest of the congregation was pretty shocked. So I explained to them and said, there are a variety of services offered on this post. They follow a variety of formats, and if this isn't your cup of tea, that's fine. That's fine. It's not a problem. I got to meet the commanding general of the post a couple of days later, and everyone was terrified of him. I went to his office expecting to be reamed up one side and down the other. He was sitting ramrod straight behind a huge mahogany desk. I was a good boy. I went in and said, Sir Chaplain Jackson reports. <laughs> and he grinned and said, Sit down over there on the couch. You drink coffee? I said, Yes, sir. What do you take in it? I said, Coffee. Pretty soon, they came in with a carafe of coffee and cups and saucers and a tray of sweet rolls. Put them down in front of the... And he gets up from his desk and comes over and sits down next to me and says, Well, welcome to Aberdeen Proving Ground. <laughs> I understand you met Mrs. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. And he said, I appreciate you standing your ground. He said, I'm not much of a churchman, but he says, I suppose I'm going to have to come and see just exactly what it is you did to offend her, because I want to commend you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually did come to church a few times. Now, why am I telling you all of that? Because the gospel reading this morning shows Jesus teaching one thing to his disciples and to a crowd. And then, of all things, not acting the way he taught, but followed the customs of the day in absolutely dismissing a woman who would have been regarded by the whole Jewish community as unclean and beneath their dignity. And that's the way he started out with her. Just that way. I have been sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. In the story of Joseph, and I will tell you, I use the Jewish study Bible a lot when I am working on Old Testament stuff. 
came out in 1985, and you know there's three groups of, of Jewish communicants in the, in the country, the Orthodox, the Conservative, and the Reformed. They don't like each other a whole lot, but they have produced an incredibly good study Bible that they all use. When I was reading about the passage I shared with you about Joseph, it gives a definition of what faith, what the word faith means in the Old Testament. It happens to be the very definition that Jesus lived out most of his life. And I just want to read that to you. It's just one sentence. Faith means trusting profoundly in a person. In most cases, the personal God who reiterates and keeps his promises. Faith means trusting profoundly in a person, in most cases, the personal God, who reiterates and keeps his promises. And here's what I want you to get out of this this morning. Where our roots are determines how we think of ourselves how we enact our faith, how we go about relating to others. Jesus was so deeply rooted in God. Constantly, the New Testament has stories of him going off to pray. Why? Is it a new chaplain reporting to his commander? No. It is a son who is totally a part of the Father keeping that relationship like this. And it's that relationship that pulls Jesus away from his initial response to this Canaanite woman, gets him back on track and allows him to do what the Father sent him on this earth to do, to demonstrate what faith really means in human life. This is so important, and I don't think that most of the time we talk about this very much. But we cannot be honest to God disciples of Jesus and real servants of God unless and until we allow God to live deeply in us and through us. Jesus modeled on this earth the transformative patterns of the new life that God offers to us, and it starts, and I was never told this as a child or as a young man, it starts with baptism. It begins with baptism. If you were baptized as an infant, you of course know nothing about that. If your family took those baptismal vows seriously, you were raised in an atmosphere of faith and grace and love. If, as was my experience, neither of my parents went to church after they were 18 years old, they walked out and stayed out. And when I was in junior high, my mother informed me one afternoon, you have to be at the church on Thursday for those classes. I said, what classes? What are you talking about? Sunday, Sunday school, I go to Sunday school. <laughs> you know. No, it's something on Thursday. It's time for you to go to those classes. Mom, what classes? 
I don't know. It's just time for you to go. The pastor's desk was on a raised dais. And he had a big leather executive chair that sat him up even higher. And guess what was brought into his little office for the nine of us that were to be in what was then called a communicants class? The little children's little wooden chairs from Sunday school. So we're sitting on these little chairs and our knees are up to our chins and he is declaiming over the desk. And I'm sitting there, what in God's name is this all about? Why am I here? And that's what most of the kids were thinking. So comes Easter Sunday of 1950. I know, it's another eon ago, but there it was. And it was time to join the church. So we're lined up in a nice little row and the pastor is in the process of asking questions and suddenly he stops and he said, all of you are baptized, aren't you? I had no idea. My parents were there for this great occasion so I turned around to the congregation, looked at my mother and she went, I said, no. What? Presbyterians are baptized as infants. Anybody else? I would never have raised my hand, but this dear little girl standing next to me that I was trying to get to go to a dance with me, shakingly raised her hand and said, I haven't been baptized either. And her dad was an elder. So you know what happened. Pastors, you go get a chalice or something out of the office and put water in it. We've got to take care of this right now. Just that way, as a snarly tone comes out, he looks at me, he says, you're first, and he scoops up, you know, he's a big dude, big palm full of water. <laughs> Ross Burling Jackson, you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> to Susan, who's in a nice dress, Susan Lee Langsford, you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we're dripping wet. We're embarrassed as we can be. And years later, after processing all of this, I tell people I was baptized in a temper tantrum. <laughs> but the idea, the idea that when one enters into the kingdom is through baptism, and for the rest of our lives, we are growing into what this whole sacrament is about. Never heard of that. Never heard of that. The big thing was just show up at church. Now, I don't know if your churches did this. I was in a different, well, sister denomination. You remember the pins you used to get for perfect attendance? I mean, we had, we had men in the congregation that had them all the way down to their ankles. <laughs> uh, but you know what? If you don't hear that there is good news, then what's it all about? And when the boom of the 1950s went pop, this church that, when I went there, had 300 men went to 1,600 members, and then 11 years later was back to 200 members, but with a building debt of over half a million dollars for those 200 people to pay off. And you know when they got it paid off? 1991. <laughs> 1991. They kept their word paid it off, the building that they built is completely unused, it's locked up, five-story building, full gym on the top floor, <laughs> Sunday school rooms all the way down, the only thing that's used is a large parlor, which is where the session meets, once a month. Missed the boat, missed the good news, didn't hear about it in any way 
but it could possibly have been internalized. I don't know if any of you golf. I have attempted. It's pretty funny, actually. Uh, somebody who was trying to teach people how to putt said, when you stand over your putt and you get your feet where you want your feet, the mental image that you need is that you're, there's a, like a insert that holds each foot completely steady. Now think of a steel rod going from the bottom of your foot about eight feet into the ground so that you are rock steady. You are absolutely not going to move from that position and then you make your putt. When I heard that, I thought that's not a bad analogy for people in the church. We have to be rooted strongly, strongly in the grace and the goodness of God. And then we're supposed to go out and let that show. And let that show. I don't know any way that the church can really grow effectively without doing that. We can gimmick, we can go with the flow, we can do lots of things. But if we do what we're supposed to do, what happens is people start saying, hmm, something different about you. What, what's changed? You seem like a different person somehow then you have the opportunity to say, I've experienced some things at my church that really are changing my life. Would you like to come and see what's happening? I'd be glad to bring you with me. That's what makes a difference. Deep roots, and even Jesus, almost, almost unrooted himself in that situation with the Canaanite woman. That's how strong the culture is that we live in. It's a tough battle, but it's a very important one to engage in. And God will be with us every step of the way.